it is a pollution. It is also causative. So I think when when considering use of aspirin, in every drug we have cost-benefit ratio. The point is that there is no doubt aspirin prevents ischemic events against electrothermic events. But bleeding risk is clear there. But if we have to prevent heart disease, so I think with use of PPI, we can use aspirin. It is low dose. Now there are lot of articles coming by using tigaclor and propionorgel, but they are very expensive. So I think a rational use of aspirin is worthy. Speakers, they have a very lucid presentation. I am really glad both presentations are very good. They have given a clear message that rational use is beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parasa. Uh, now, uh, two quick questions from the audience before we wind up the session. Any burning question from the audience, please? Very simple. Everybody has special. Thank you very much. I think then. G, please. The benefit of the acetyl salicylic acid, which has been proven in the research, and of course all these Western-based, okay, that is started happening from 25 milligram. But the standard dose, the smallest standard dose, which is also known as baby aspirin, the West 81 milligram and 75 milligram here, or 75 milligram here. So this is the dose which should be given. You can double the dose as far as the uh, cerebrovascular events are concerned. Pertaining to your thing that acetyl salicylic acid, when given in preventing these events, it is a lifelong business as simple as that. Okay? And uh, the high dose acetyl salicylic acid in very low population can give rise to gastric erosion. Okay? But in a dose which is given, the data has proven that less number of people goes into, okay, as far as upper GI bleeding is concerned. So, it's the duration which may matter and uh, if the risk is there, then you have to cut down the, uh, the incidence or the chances of bleeding by giving a PPI which is as a routine these days, okay. So that is the one thing which I can say. The dose is, the smallest one is given, which is proven, but it's a lifelong business, as simple as that, but can give rise to, okay. And then if the benefit is there, the risk is high, you cover that risk by adding a drug which can minimize or limit the GI bleeding. I would just uh, say a few points because questions of Isaac was regarding dose or duration. Now we already have decided that lowest possible dose can be given. So dose issue is, and this is a kind of drug which has to be given lifelong. So duration is also there. The only thing you have to look for the risk factors of bleeding in that particular individual in terms of GI issues, other comorbids, even CKD can be a risk factor which can increase bleeding or IHD both. So it's individual conclusive risk factor of bleedings which are important as compared to aspirin dose or duration because dose is already lowest possible. Is there any means just like a risk calculator has CVD ka koi hum bleeding ka koi calculator bana le? Koi? ایسپرین 
स्टेटिन का एंटी डायबिटिक्स का हमारे पास एविडेंस होता है कि जी कोलेस्ट्रॉल कम हो गया ये हो गया एस्प्रिंग पे अनफॉर्चुनेटली जितनी स्टडीज हुई हैं उसका कोई कैलकुलेटर नहीं है कि हु इज गोइंग टू बेनिफिट हु इज नॉट दैट इज वॉट दे आर वर्किंग एंड दैट इज वॉट दे आर गोइंग टू प्लान स्टडीज कि वी शुड हैव ऑब्जेक्टिव एविडेंस कि एस्प्रिन इज वर्किंग और नॉट वर्किंग कई दफ़ा एस्प्रिन का रेजिस्टेंस भी होता है बट कैन इट कैन स्टिल कॉज डी आई प्रॉब्लम्स तो आई थिंक वी लुक फॉर्वर्ड टू हैविंग सम स्टडीज इन फ्यूचर which will be looking at direct evidence whether the aspirin is working or not and i think that is where it will become very clear who to give aspirin who not to give aspirin i think let's conclude the session other we said pehle ke rashid sahab aa jaye aap to we break for 10 minutes you can have a cup of tea and come back to start the next session and aap chai ke cup ke sath bhi yahan aa sakte hain hmm to let's have a quick breakfast and come in hmm
uh, please have a seat. We are already short of time. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, I am Professor Abdul Samad, cardiologist and professor of cardiology uh, here uh, in Jalal Medical and Dental College. I am the moderator of this session. Uh, as you know, this whole day, uh, session is uh, under the umbrella of the uh, National Congress of Preventive Cardiology uh, here in the. Medicare Hospital. The Medicare Hospital is the teaching hospital of the Jinnah Medical and Dental College, which is uh, affiliated with the Swell Trust University. Uh, as you know, the topic indicates that this is all day scientific session is focused on the preventive cardiology. Means the prevention is better than cure. It's the mere theme of this our studies. And uh, one session has been uh, concluded, which was about the uh, re re reduction of, uh, uh, prevention of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, by aspirin. I think it was a mis misnomer. It means uh, the prevention is not possible by aspirin. Aspirin, because the cardiovascular disease is caused by atherosclerosis, and the aspirin has no role in the atherosclerosis, as Dr. Pawad said. The aspirin, yes, it prevents the incidence of cardiovascular events. It prevents the atherosclerotic thrombotic events of the disease. That's why it was a very important, uh, informative session regarding to this thing. So you clear it that aspirin uh, prevents the thromboatherotic events of the cardiovascular disease. And the second session which I'm moderating is about the ischemic heart disease. It will be uh, uh, consists of the a few lectures, and after that we will be proceed for the inauguration of the session. Inauguration will be start at the uh, 11 uh, p.m. Uh, for one hour, in which the chief guest, the vice chancellor, and the management will be highlights the health facilities uh, available here in the Medicare hospital and also the associated hospitals. And after that, uh, then we will be proceed for the cardiometabolic disorders. In cardiometabolic disorder, in this prevention and role of diabetes and his drug will be discussed. And after that, uh, around uh, 1 uh, 45, uh, there will be a break for the lunch and also for the prayer. And simultaneously, there will be a workshop uh, on the Google School Scholar, which will be uh, discussed by the uh, Dr. Javed Masood, and uh, it will be just for the 15 minutes, 
and after that uh, there will be a female dominant session. Uh, there's no news. It's very difficult for me. <laughs> no news. Uh, go red. Go red for the women's uh, under the umbrella of Pakistan Cardiac Society and the American Heart Association. Uh, it will be discussed all the cardiovascular disease burden uh, which are uh, uh, affects the pregnancy in the female gender. It will be discussed uh, by Professor Khalda Sumro and their team. And uh, after that, uh, there will be uh, uh, another session, uh, which are the prevention of the rheumatic heart disease and the peripheral arterial disease and the role of tobacco, calcium scoring, obesity, and diet, this will be discussed. And then after that, there will be conclusion, uh, conclusive remarks and the distribution of the uh, shield will be happened. So I will proceed for my uh, second session. It is uh, with the topic uh, ischemic heart disease and uh, different strategies to prevent ischemic heart disease. In this session, uh, I will uh, invite the chairperson by name and by brief uh, discussion, uh, by uh, introduction. Uh, the first is the Professor Ijaz Wara. Uh, Ijaz Wara is the uh, Dean Medical uh, uh, of Medical Sciences. Uh, he is a Zawadi Medical University. May I request to please, no, no, please have a seat. Come on. And uh, a second uh, a guest, or uh, the chairperson, is uh, Professor Feroz Mehman. He is from Hyderabad. And uh, he is a principal of Indus uh, Medical College in the Tundra Khan. Please, thank you. And the uh, third one is the Professor Wakar Khazmi. Sir. Wakar Khazmi is an uh, eminent nephrologist and ex-principal of Karachi Medical and Dental College. And the uh, next one is Professor Ishtiak Rasul Sahib, my teacher and uh, professor of uh, cardiology at the Liaquat National Hospital. Thank you. And the next is my colleague, uh, Dr. Tariq Masood. Tariq Masood is the professor of, was the professor of cardiology uh, in the NICVD, now working in the National Medical uh, Center as a cardiologist. And the uh, next one is Dr. Javed Sial, who is not uh, come here. He will be uh, come soon. Uh, so uh, I will be invite the first speaker of the session. He is uh, uh, Professor Feroz Mehman Saab. And the topic is uh, a preven preventing cardiovascular diseases and need for the collaboration. Please, uh, Dr. Feroz Mehman Saab. Thank you very much, sir. Samad Sahib, bohut bohut shukri aapka. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in a new setup in the middle of uh, urban city of Karachi. We have all the best institutes were on the periphery. So now the center of Karachi has the benefit being in this cardiac center by run by Professor Mansoor and Professor Rashid. This is a dynamic duo, and whenever they get together, they produce fatal results, a fatal in interest of cardiology. They did a good job in Dakar National, and I'm sure that they are going to do an amazing job over here by developing center. Thank you very much, sir, for inviting us to be over here. The thing is that first session we have talked about prevention by aspirin. So basically before we go on treatment, I think we should go for prevention. Now this is the center which uh, uh, is here in the building, in the center here. And this is... Yeah. This is my center, Indus Medical College, University of Modern Sciences. Incidentally, the Soil University and our university got the charter at the same time in 2018. This was an urban university, ours a rural university, and this is the first rural medical center in the in, uh, interior of Sindh. Baki sare bade shayro mein hai. So we are privileged that we have got a center somewhere down. Now you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Jab tak ab shuru dhi ke rehenge, ab bade nahi ban sakte. So what we are talking today is that uh, overall cardiovascular disease is is basically more people die from cardiovascular disease than any other disease and estimated 17.1 million died in 2004, about 29% of all global deaths and cardiovascular disease on the top followed with the coronary artery disease, the first single major cause of mortality in Europe and so many people die of that. 
Now, if you look here, is this is what really affects us, and we were talking here this morning, is that the low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected. High income countries are doing good, but here this is where we are low income countries, and we all depend on Abibi Kalisa, Dar Sab, Kaya, Dekhi, IMF, Nami Bachaliya. So we are depending on the income of some people coming from else, and 82% of cardiovascular deaths take place in low and middle income countries and occur almost equally in men and women. So this is where a disaster comes to us. Now, if by 230, it's estimated that 23.6 million people will die from cardiovascular disease, mainly from heart disease and stroke, a huge figure. But what we see here is that largest percentage increase will occur in the eastern Mediterranean region. The largest increase in number of deaths will occur in South East Asia region. That's where we live. So we are really vulnerable to this problem. And are we ready? In Pakistan, we had 675,000 deaths in 2001 were expected. And one in four subjects aged over 40 have underlying coronary disease in Pakistan. And now what we see is, as Fawad was saying this morning, and people from Cardiovascular Disease Institute, all they say that we are getting people at the age of 30 years when their career is not yet started, coming it with MIs and all these things. Now, in surveys in Pakistan, it indicates the high prevalence rates of cardiovascular disease risk factors with over 30% of population over 45 years of age. So while people are talking of West Nile, monkeypox, SARS, we are still talking of a heart attack, which is happening. And instead of preventing them, which is being done, the incidence of ischemic heart disease has gone down by 30% in Western world, while we have got about 30% increase in our part of the world. And what they have done is they have imported McDonald's to our region and they put shut down their shops there. So this is why we are suffering. Now the risk factors, the disease which we need to prevent, for example, hypertension in Pakistan in 2005 was about 18 percent adults suffered from hypertension, and then in 2000. 14, we had 25 percent adult population in Pakistan from high blood pressure, a high number, high incidence. Then we look at the meta-analysis. Every 10 years, 1990s, we had 20%, 2000, we had 23%, and 2010 was 30%. Instead of giving it a break, we went on going up. And what really breakthrough came was Basit and his uh, group from uh, Bakai Institute, they said that there was an overall edge assisted weight prevalence of bed was 46% in Pakistan. We were amazed, there was a lot of talk on it. Is it true, is it not true? But then, actually, I got a chance that we had got an international society of hypertension through which we have made major months and we major measured blood pressure across the society of a journal subject, not of hypertensives. And we saw that 2017 it was 55 percent, in 18 it was 58 percent, in 19 it was 52 percent, 20 because of COVID we could not do it. Sorry. In 2021, it was 54%, and in 2022, which was last year, we had 52%, and we scanned about 32,000 subjects all over Pakistan. And this, uh, these all three papers are accepted by European Journal of uh, Cardiology. So this has been really targeted. Now, when we look at diabetes, Worldwide, we've got a very high figure, but the maximum figure is in Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia, where 90 per million people suffer from diabetes, a very high number. In Pakistan, 6.9 million people are affected by diabetes, and it was expected that in 2025, we'll have 11.5 million people suffering from hypertension, from diabetes. So, was it true? No, no. We surprised them that in 2021, we have got 33 million people suffering from diabetes in Pakistan, a huge number, double than what we expected, the uh, world expected out of us. And we are at number three. And number one and two are in China and India, and we take a population disproportionate, then actually we are number one. Percentage is, we have come three because of the China and India, they have saved us. And prevalence, look, from 2016 to 22, from 10% we have gone to 30%. But the interesting thing is that if we look at the ratio wise, the least uh, incidence is in KPK. So, this is the same thing in the past. But the same thing in the past Pakistan, I don't know why. And look at the chronic complicated diabetes, foot disease, ocular condition, nephropathy, neuropathy, cerebral conditions, cardiovascular. All these are miserable conditions which make you disabled. 
पीपल से कि जी जिंदगी है तो हो जाएगी सवाल ये कि ब्लड प्रेशर डायबिटीज मेक यू डिसेबल एंड डू यू वांट टू बी विदाउट अ लेग एम्पुटेड लेग और अ नेफ्रोपैथी वी हैव गॉट रीनल फिजिशियंस हियर सेरेब्रल और सीवीएस एट एज ऑफ 40 इयर्स यू आर लाइंग ऑन अ बेड लाइक अ वेजिटेबल एंड नोबडी देयर टू केयर ऑफ यू and then other risk factors dyslipidemia we have got a very high level of triglyceridemia and hdl level is very low in our community and what we need to do is lose 50 kg of the bad scum and what is you instead of losing it you are gaining it and what i always say is that in 1990s we had a big television huge tv jo do mezon pe aati thi aur hum log patle hote the ab now in 2020 we have a slim smart tvs aur hum sab mote baithe hue channel change kar rahe hote hain usme so that's what we are fitting then we are talking of metabolic syndrome about 70% people in pakistan suffer from west circum's problem and about 50% people have got metabolic syndrome and this is what happened health department kehte hai ki cigarette mat piyo hum sab hall ke baar cigarette pi ke phir andar aate hain andar nahi pi rahe because hum bahut acche hain ab one thing i want to share what is very interesting we learned in uh, burban uh, last month that one of the secretary said ki ji unhone packet pe likha ki cigarette smoking is injurious to health or it will lead you to cancer lung or something like that to log phir bhi khareed rahe the to unhone kaha ji best thing is put it that cigarette smoking will lead to impotence तो वो लगा दिया तो अगला बंदा जब वो लेने गया उसने कहा यार इम्पोर्टेंस वाले ही मुझे कैंसर वाली सिगरेट दे दो तो ही आई मीन हमारी प्रायोरिटीज कितनी डिफरेंट है दिस इज व्हाट द प्रॉब्लम प्रिवलेंस ऑफ स्मोकिंग इज 25 परसेंट एंड मेजॉरिटी मेल स्मोक एंड दे थिंक इट्स अ मेल शोवनिज्म के हम सिगरेट पी रहे हैं बहुत अच्छे लग रहे हैं नो अब इंटरेस्टिंग बात है कि जब इतने प्रॉब्लम्स हैं डायबिटीज मेटाबॉलिक हाइपरटेंशन स्मोकिंग तो वी वुड हैव बीन ऑन रियल प्रिवेंशन ओवर 31 मिलियन पाकिस्तान द रिस्क ऑफ डेवलपमेंट कार्डियो कोनियाटी डिजीज और वी नीड टू हैव अ यूटिलाइजेशन ऑफ प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन एंड व्हाट वी डू इज दैट ओनली 9 परसेंट पीपल आर टेकिंग एस्प्रिन हर मीटिंग में हर प्रोग्राम में वी हैव एस्प्रिन सेशन वी टेल देम कि जी ये कितना अच्छा है सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन के लिए और हम जैसे तो प्राइमरी में ही प्रो कर रहे हैं लेकिन फिर भी सिर्फ दस परसेंट लोग ले रहे हैं स्टेट इन ओनली वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट सो वे एज प्रिवेंशन इट्स ओनली ट्रीटमेंट बिकॉज वी डोंट हैव टाइम ना ऑलवेज लाइक दिस लाइट इज योर हेल्थ इज एन इन्वेस्टमेंट नॉट एन एक्सपेंस आज आप जो अपने वो खर्च कर रहे हैं वो कल आपको जैसे इंश्योरेंस प्रीमियम मिलता है वो आपको बेनिफिट होगा अगर आज आपने जो पराठे और अंडा खाया तो कल आपको जब डायबिटीज हो जाएगी ब्लड प्रेशर आ जाएगी तो आपने लूज कर दिया सो यू स्टार्ट राइट फ्रॉम नाउ to start saving yourself now what's the urgent need for preventive program is there are inevitable factors like age gender family history so we can't do anything but we can have a behavior risk factors like smoking unhealthy diet sedentary lifestyles and socio economic culture determinant badi shaadiyan karte hain 25 dishes rakhte hain 50 dishes rakhte hain sare bach jate hain phenk dete hain like we find it it's a cultural tradition hum bade log hain or early life characteristics we have now known that ischemic atherosclerosis starts at 2 years of age like abhi bhi hamari naniyan dadiyan bachon ko thoonsti hain mota banati hain kehte hain hame gugglu baby chahiye gugglu baby nahi chahiye hame sehatmand bachcha chahiye because the problem is that when it starts aur abhi bhi hum baat karte hain hamare paas females aati hain after pregnancy to wo apne weight zyada ho gaya kya ho gaya ji us सास कह रहे हैं कि मीठा खाओ चिकनाई खाओ ये चीज़ें ये खाओ इससे दूध ज़्यादा बनता है विच इज़ अ मिस कॉन्सेप्ट नाउ दिस इज वेयर वी शुड गो एंड ट्राई एंड एक्सप्लेन आर पेशेंट्स की क्या होता है और फिजिकल रिस्क फैक्टर लाइक हाइपर टेंशन कोलेस्ट्रॉल डायबिटीज तो ये सब कंट्रोल नहीं करेंगे तो एंड पॉइंट विल भी हार्ट डिजीज स्ट्रोक वेस्कुलर डिजीज कैंसर एंड दैट्स वेयर वी विल स्टार्ट अर्निंग द थिंग्स नाउ द प्रॉब्लम इज जो वॉट वी कैन डू इज दिस अ मिस मैच बिटवीन हेल्थ केयर नीड्स एंड रिसोर्स इट्स वेरी वाइड नीड एंड वॉट वी नीड टू डू इज टू हैव अ पॉलिसी टू प्रोटाइज द बेसिस ऑफ डिजीज बर्डन कॉस्ट इफेक्टिवनेस एंड इक्विटी दिस नेसेस नीड टू एस्टेब्लिश प्रिवेंटिव कार्डियो वेस्कुलर डिजीज प्रोग्राम एट ऑल लेवल फ्रॉम गवर्नमेंट टू प्राइवेट सेक्टर्स एंड वी हैव गॉट थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ प्रिवेंशन प्री मॉडियल विच इज प्रिवेंशन ऑफ अपेयरेंस ऑफ रिस्क फैक्टर primary where we control the risk factors secondary when we control the cardiovascular complications and unfortunately we are just doing the third one we are controlling cardiovascular complications prevention to hai nahi hamare paas time hi nahi hai and what are the constraints limited recognition available data on cardiovascular disease data mar pas nahi abhi hum baat kar rahe the meri data mein jameel ko nahi dunga yaar wo le lega we don't share we don't count we don't write and prevention is not taken seriously because of market pressures agar cigarette aa rahi hai aa rahi hai aap advertisement dekhein ki bahut acha drama chal raha hai tere bin chal raha hai uske beech mein advertisement sari wo aati hain jo fatty food ki hoti hain ghee ki hoti hain talo pakwan ho raha hai aise se khana dikha rahe hain ki main bibi se kehta hu ye kahan pakte hain maine kabhi nahi dekhe kehte yahi dekh lo tum and then 
स्ट्रोक एंड कोरोना हार्ट डिजीज या कैंसर डिजीज ऑफ स्पेशलिस्ट वो ट्रीट करेंगे जी अभी तो ठीक है जब हो जाएगा तो देखा जाएगा ब्लड प्रेशर कोई बात नहीं दवा न लें और जब आता है तो सीवी हो गया हार्ट डिजीज हो गई तो दे आर नॉट एड्रेस प्रोस्पेक्टिवली बाई एग्जिस्टिंग हेल्थ सिस्टम एंड कॉस्ट आर राइजिंग वो हमारा मसला बढ़ रहा है तो इट डज नॉट मैटर हाउ मेनी रिसोर्स यू हैव इफ यू डोंट नो हाउ टू यूज दैम इट विल नेवर बी इनफ इफ यू डोंट नो हाउ टू यूज द रिसोर्स का कोई फायदा ही नहीं है एंड वॉट आर द बैरियर्स सबसे बड़ा बैरियर तो खुद गवर्नमेंट है आई आई होप देर इज नो गवर्नमेंट पीपल सिटिंग हेयर एंड वे क्या दे आर वेरी ब्यूरोक्रेटिक सेक्रेटरी हेल्थ से मुलाकात करने के लिए आई एम वाइस चांसलर ग्रेड ट्वेंटी टू सेक्रेटरी ग्रेड ट्वेंटी मुझे एक महीना लगता है अपॉइंटमेंट लेने मिश्ता रसूल इज सिटिंग हेयर ही नोज वैन वॉज जनरल सेक्रेटरी कार्डिक सोसाइटी हाउ लॉन्ग वी टूक टू मीट सेक्रेटरी हेल्थ वी जस्ट कुड नॉट मीट दैम एंड देन दे आर वेरी स्लो एंड इफेक्टिव पॉलिसी बनाएंगे पेपर वर्क हो जाएगा चाय बिस्किट का खर्चा बढ़ जाएगा काम कुछ नहीं होता एंड पॉलिसी को इन्फ्लुएंस नहीं होती हमारा मेडिकल एजुकेशन सिस्टम फे फोकस टू वर्ड सेकेंडरी ट्रेशरी केयर इन पब्लिक हेल्थ एंड प्रिवेंशन नीचे तो हम पढ़ाते ही नहीं हमारे सिलेबस में प्रिवेंशन है ही नहीं कार्डिक सोसाइटी जो हमने बनाई हुई है आई बिन प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ कार्डिक सोसाइटी इफेक्टिव इज रीचिंग आउट टू पब्लिक थ्रू मीडिया हमारे पास है ही नहीं मीडिया को हम यूज़ ही नहीं कर रहे वोरा साहब आज कह रहे थे कि जो मीडिया को यूज़ करो फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट है वो हम नहीं करते और स्पेशलिस्ट जर्नलिस्ट कम्युनिकेशन लेक करता है वी डू नॉट मीट विद जनरल फिजिशन एंड जनरल प्रैक्टिशन सो कॉमनली के कह रहे हैं और देर स्ट्रॉन्ग हेल्थ बिलीव एंड लेक ऑफ अवेयरनेस एजुकेशन नॉलेज जो हमारा कूसरे के हम पास ऑन नहीं कर सके हैं सो वॉट वी नीड इज टू टेक एक्शन पुटिंग प्रेजेंट वर्क इन टू नॉलेज अमल के बगैर इल्म बेकार है देर इज नो पॉइंट एडुकेट आर प्राइमरी केयर फिजिशियन क्रिएट मैस अवेयरनेस इनिशियटिव एंड टारगेट अवेयरनेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल वर्क प्लेस वर्कशिप प्लेस जैसे अभी हम बात कर रहे थे अभी नाश्ते पर पराठा अंडा सब कुछ खाते हुए कि लोगों को मस्जिद में जाकर बताएंगे क्या करना चाहिए उनको स्टर्निंग कैप ट्रांसफॉर्मिंग ऑर्गेनाइजेशन स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ पब्लिक हेल्थ एजेंसी पार्टनरशिप हम मिल के ऑर्गेनाइजेशन मिल के काम करें लोगों को टारगेट करें बताएँ कि क्या प्रॉब्लम है हमारे पास रिसर्च बिल्कुल नहीं है रिसर्च सोसाइटी हमारे पास नहीं है चार पांच जर्नल हैं जो काम करते हैं शौकत जावेद आई मस्ट अप्रिशिएट हिम कि ही इज रनिंग वन ऑफ द बेस्ट जर्नल इन पाकिस्तान लेकिन रिसर्च कल्चर कम है इन लोगों ने पैदा किया वरना पहले हमारे ज़माने में हम रिसर्च नहीं करते थे पेपर लिखते थे प्रोमोशन के लिए एंड कैपिटलाइजिंग ऑन शेयर्ड एक्सपीरियंसिस अब जो है प्रॉब्लम ये है कि जब हमारा प्रिवेंशन का टाइम होता है तो हम सो रहे होते हैं जब ट्रीटमेंट का टाइम होता है सो लेट तो कर्व गोज रॉन्ग वे जबकि इट शुड गो दिस वे वी शुड स्टार्ट प्रिवेंटिंग हेयर सो दैट वी एंड अप विदाउट एनी ट्रीटमेंट वी डू वी शुड डू बेटर हमारा कर्व ही उल्टा बना हुआ है इट ऑलवेज सीम्स इम्पॉसिबल अंटिल इट्स डन आप पूछ करें मैदान में उतरें इट विल बी डन जस्ट डोंट थिंक इट नहीं हो सकता लेट्स ज्वाइन हैंड्स टूगेदर previous disease in pakistan we have to make it together and prevention is the best buy hum jab tuberculosis rok sakte the cholera rok sakte the why can't we do with ischemic heart disease action kya karna hai humne we should have conferences in a limited way but they are very effective regular area based experience ke hum different areas mein jaye reach out to rural areas as aspirin foundation jati hai use of web social medias and cardiac society will take up quiz conferences meetings to encourage youngsters सेलिब्रेट डब्ल्यू एच ओ डेज लाइक वर्ल्ड हार्ड डे लेकिन नॉट इन ए होटल एक चीज़ हमेशा हमारी जो कि हम फाइव स्टार होटल में प्रोग्राम करते हैं वही कंसर्न बैठते हैं जिनको सारा पता होता है तो वेर द मास अवेयरनेस पब्लिक कहाँ है वहाँ पर वी शुड हैव कम्युनिटी बेस्ड प्रोग्राम रन बाय जी पीज अंडर सपोर्ट बाई कंसल्टेंट्स एंड इंडस्ट्री अगेन यूज ऑफ सोशल मीडिया विच इज़ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट लेक्चर्स बाई कंसल्टेंट पब्लिक प्राइवेट सेक्टर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हम स्कूल में जाएँ कॉलेज में जाएँ इवन मेडिकल कॉलेज में फर्स्ट ईयर सेकेंड ईयर को पढ़ाएं बिकॉज दे आर द पीपल हु विल इन्फ्लुएंस दे their parents and grand parents how to prevent disease or wo apne aap ko prevent karna shuru kar denge and involve kill mosque temples church targeted program in school college this we should do we only a one life one today only this moment life for right now because all you really have aaj ka din abhi ka mauka abhi ka time hai tomorrow never comes aur log the sydney sheldon kehta na if tomorrow comes where is tomorrow there is no tomorrow so to save precious life we have to give a big squeeze to our population who are at risk of developing coronary artery disease we should stop it developing rather than treat it and do anything else jazakallah thank you very much <laughs> thanks a lot thank you uh, professor feroz mehman uh, we are already short of time one hours for discussion because we have uh, in the last we have the time no time for the question and answer and for the will invite
Uh, no, I invite to Professor Waris Kedwai uh, for his uh, next topic. And the prevention made for the hypertension. Professor uh, Kedwai, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am very grateful to the organizers to uh, have. کہ ایسا ہے جیسے کہ سورج کو چراغ دکھانے کے برابر ہے کیونکہ یہاں پہ ہمارے سارے سینئر لوگ بیٹھے ہوئے ہیں جن سے میں نے پڑھا ہے تو مجھے بہت شرمندگی بھی ہوتی ہے I'm going to talk about prevention جس کے بارے میں آج یہ کانفرنس ہے اور میں آپ سے یہ کہنا چاہوں گا کہ دیکھیں میری talk جو ہے ہو سکتا ہے بہت dry ہو جائے at some point in time because it is not a dry topic but it can go dry تو جو لوگ بچارے جن کے پاس بال ہیں وہ تو اپنے بال نوچیں گے لیکن جو لوگ جن کے پاس اللہ نے بال جن کو نہیں دیئے وہ ذرا خیال کریں براور پر والا ان کے بال نوچے گا تو just be very careful about that اتنے اچھے اچھے لوگ یہاں بیٹھے ہیں اور میں جب بھی ان لوگوں سے ملتا ہوں تو میں کچھ نہ کچھ سیکھ کے جاتا ہوں اپنے آپ کو بہتر کر کے جاتا ہوں تو اس کے بارے میں ایک چھوٹا سا قطع ہے جو میں آپ کے خدمت میں پیش کروں گا کسی نے خاک میری ہتیلی میں رکھ دی کسی نے خاک میری ہتیلی میں رکھ دی میری آنکھوں میں حیرت سی بھر دی مشت تھی امبر تھی نہ جانے کیا تھی خوشبو بہت ہی دل ربا تھی میں پوچھ بیٹھا کہ یہ راز کیا ہے تو اگر خاک ہے تو یہ اجاز کیا ہے وہ بولی میں کچھ بھی نہیں ہوں بس ایک صحبت میں گل کے رہی ہوں وہ گل مجھ پہ عنایت کر گیا ہے میں کل بھی خاک تھی آج بھی وہی ہوں تو یہ اچھی صحبت سے انسان کو سیکھنے کو ملتا ہے اور ہمارے ہاں تو ماشاءاللہ اتنے اچھے اچھے پڑے لکھے لوگ ہیں اتنی اچھی اچھی باتیں کرتے ہیں کہ ہمیشہ خوشی ہوتی ہے یہاں آ کر کے اچھا میں سٹارٹ کرتا ہوں اپنی ٹاک بیسکلی آئی ایم گوئن ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ دی رسک فیکٹرز اینڈ دی پریونشٹیو میجرز فور کنٹرول آف ہائپر ٹینشن اگر آپ رسک فیکٹرز دیکھتے ہیں تو میری کوئی راکٹ سائنس والی ٹاک نہیں ہے اٹس ویری سمپل بیسک پریونٹیو ٹاک ہے تو اگر آپ رسک فیکٹرز کی بات کرتے ہیں تو یہاں پر بیسکلی انکریزنگ ایج is one of the risk factors we all know that and that is non modifiable کیونکہ اس کو آپ modify تو کر نہیں سکتے ہیں اور میرے جو students آکے جب case present کرتے ہیں تو وہ کہتے ہیں 65 years old 45 years old تو میں کہتا ہوں نہیں بیٹا old کا لفظ dictionary میں نہیں ہے you know just say 65 years man or woman or whatever but don't say old because old gives a very bad connotation but unfortunately we are all getting old as the days are passing and we uh, and that's a risk factor for hypertension uh, uh, until the age of 64 years men are more uh, likely to have hypertension after the age of 65 it's more women uh, then uh, race is also one of the factors african americans are known to have Uh, more uh, hypertension plus at an earlier age and they, uh, you know, their prognosis is also not good. Uh, and uh, maybe if we study uh, some parts of our own population, there are studies in Pakistan that have been done and we have identified certain groups that are more prone to hypertension. That's a risk factor. Uh, Family history is, of course, a very big risk factor. Uh, if somebody uh, has uh, siblings who are hypertensive, parents who are hypertensive, more chances that the person in question will have high blood pressure with time. So that's, again, a risk factor. Uh, then uh, obesity is, of course, a risk factor. And, uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we, ha we, are have a, we have a pandemic of epidemic, uh, epidemic of uh, Uh, pandemic of uh, obesity all around the world so uh, so it, it, the more uh, weight you have the more likely that your blood pressure is going to go up and uh, as we all know that uh, fat is also a, a cause for insulin resistance so more chances of insulin resistance and diabetes so they're all brothers and sisters that's the way we look at it uh, then we have a uh, lack of exercise uh, people who are sedentary having sedentary lifestyle Uh, they are more likely to have hypertension and those who exercise regularly they are less likely to have hypertension so uh, exercise is a is a lack of exercise and sedentary lifestyle is a risk factor tobacco use is a risk factor for 
uh, atherosclerosis for coronary artery disease, cerebral, uh, cerebrovascular disease, uh, but it's not directly a risk factor for hypertension, but it raises when, we, when a person smokes the, with nicotine, the blood pressure goes up. And then uh, obviously, because nicotine causes uh, uh, atherosclerosis and uh, other things, so which are risk factors for, high, high, for hypertension. So uh, uh, tobacco use is a, a very important risk factor that we have to consider when we are trying to prevent hypertension. Uh, too much salt is again a risk factor, and we all know that the sodium it causes water retention and it causes a raise in blood pressure, and it also has got an uh, impact on endothelial uh, dysfunction and all other things. Uh, drinking too much alcohol, uh, that is also a risk factor for hypertension, and uh, I will, uh, when we talk of prevention, then I will talk about it. Unfortunately, what we have seen in Pakistan that people uh, who take alcohol, they, uh, they do take it in excess. We don't have social uh, uh, alcohol users that much as we have in the West, but over here, uh, excessive alcohol is also one of the problems which causes hypertension. Uh, stress, of course, we know stress uh, causes all the uh, uh, hormones to go up, uh, which uh, uh, sort of uh, prepare us for the fight and the flight and all that, and that causes uh, blood pressure to go up. So, uh, and chronic stress will, of course, will lead to uh, hypertension and it's a risk factor. And then chronic conditions are also there, uh, like kidney disease, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea is a very well-known cause for hypertension. So these are the risk factors, and I'm being a primary care physician, so I'm mostly focusing on the risk factors and trying to those, correct those which are modifiable. Increasing age, we have no control. But other things, of course, we can control. Then I come to the next part of my private presentation, and which is the prevention uh, of hypertension. What can we do to prevent hypertension? Uh, the first point is controlling body weight. Uh, we know that blood pressure goes up if your weight is more. And uh, weight loss is one of the effective ways in controlling blood pressure. So in general, if one millimeter of mercury uh, uh, drop in blood pressure is achieved by losing one kilogram of weight. So when a patient comes to my clinic, even if he's not uh, grossly overweight, uh, he's, he, maybe he's, uh, he's uh, just overweight, not, not obese, I would encourage him to lose at least five kilograms of weight in the next five months, you know. So that brings down the blood pressure by five millimeters mercury. If we look at all the preventive measures, we can bring down the blood pressure systolic by at least 35 millimeters mercury. So probably all the uh, medic, uh, industry which manufactures these antihypertensive medicines, uh, medicines, they will go bankrupt if we really follow the preventive measures, you know, for blood pressure. Uh, then we, uh, waist, uh, waistline is very important. Uh, for men it is uh, 40 inches and for women it is 35 inches. If the waistline is more than this, more chances of uh, uh, hypertension. So we need to control weight for this reason and uh, try to control blood pressure, prevent blood pressure from, uh, by controlling weight. Now the second thing is regular exercise. Uh, how many people in this uh, gathering exercise daily? Can you raise your hand? Now, where, where do we stand as a community, as a society, you know, when we hardly exercise, you know. So uh, that, that's one of the things that, you know, uh, we have to take forward, that exercise is very, very important. Uh, if we really want to control hypertension and uh, non-communicable diseases, like Professor Bora just told us, that uh, uh, non-communicable diseases are, is now a biggest killer in our, in our country. So we, if we want to do that, then exercise is one of the way forward. Um, we can bring down the blood pressure by five to eight millimeters mercury if we exercise regularly. 30 minutes of moderate exercise is what we need. Uh, and uh, elevated blood pressure will not change into high blood pressure if we reg exercise regularly. And uh, also, uh, there are two types of exercises, the aerobic and the non-aerobic, the uh, anaerobic exercise. So uh, in aerobic exercises, we are using oxygen. And uh, basically, it's 30 minutes of brisk walk is what we really recommend to our patients. Then anaerobic is also intermittent, uh, you know, interval uh, intense exercise. That causes the anaerobic system to work and that is also shown to be beneficial in uh, preventing high, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, 
then dietary approaches. Of course, diet is most important. Uh, there are two elements in controlling weight, diet and exercise. So the other one is the diet. In the diet, we have the uh, DASH approach, which is the dietary approaches to control hypertension, then uh, the, the Mediterranean diet. A basic concept is to have more vegetables, more fruits, less saturated fat, uh, trans fatty acid, uh, it was mentioned in the morning, you know, we should have that kind of regulation that we don't have trans fatty acids in our in our uh, cookings. So all that is very important. So diet is extremely important for weight control and control of hypertension. Uh, sodium, salt. Uh, now we have a lot of figures here. Uh, 1.5 grams of uh, uh, or 2.3 grams of uh, s salt uh, every day, sodium every day. But uh, when we tell our patient, we tell them that one teaspoon of salt and uh, level up. Uh, that is the all that you have, can take during a day. Uh, avoid uh, high, uh, adding salt when you are sitting uh, on the table eating food. Uh, and whenever you uh, sort of uh, uh, buy any food, try to look at the, in, uh, the, in, uh, the content of salt in that food. Processing food, processed food is more uh, rich in salt. So it's better not to eat processed food. So all that, these things are very important. Uh, smoking cessation, of course, smoking cessation is very important. And uh, 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 one of the things that we have found is that, uh, and it's reported in literature also, that people who have uh, heart attacks or MIs earlier on in their life are diabetics and are smokers. You know, they, they, that's, I mean, these are the, this is the lethal combination. So we, we try to uh, encourage our, uh, our patients not to smoke. I was told that one packet of cigarette, the ordinary one is now 500 rupees a day. So, uh, I mean, it's way out. I think the cost of, the way the cost of living is going up, I mean, we can really uh, uh, take, advocate to patients uh, not to smoke. So it is going to be good for them. Uh, li limiting alcohol. Now, alcohol is uh, something that we should try to uh, uh, help our patients with. We see a lot of patients coming to our clinics with uh, history of uh, alcohol use. So we need to try to help them, you know, because then this will prevent uh, hypertension. And of course, uh, we have proper sleep and st uh, stress management and rest and all that. So all these things are important in prevention of uh, hypertension. Uh, somebody had mentioned in the morning uh, that primary care physicians are the backbone of any health system. Uh, I would say uh, that what we need is a st strong health system. It's not just primary care, it's not secondary care, it's not second tertiary care, it's not quaternary care. It is a strong health system which is functional. You know, so 90% of the problems can be taken care at the primary care and the rest can be taken care at the secondary and tertiary levels. Uh, uh, one of the cardiologists uh, who used to work with us at Aachen University and our colleagues, when we were discussing our budget uh, uh, plans for the next year and the budget people were there, uh, he to pointed out at me and he said, please send all these patients, non-complicated patients to Professor Kidwai. We don't, I don't want to see them. I want to see patients whom I can take down and do an angioplasty. You know, and he said, you will get more revenues out of it if you use this. You know, people are fearful that if the primary care physicians are treating these uncomplicated cases, then the, uh, the secondary and tertiary level uh, people will not be getting enough patients to look after. But that is not true because if you let the primary care physician do their work, then the pr secondary and the tertiary level physicians, they will be more productive, more useful and the revenue will not come down. Uh, I would I'd like to end here, but before I end here, I'm going to say another uh, uh, short Urdu words, uh, verse. Uh, uh, presentation about life, you know, what life is all about. We don't understand life, unfortunately, you know, that's the problem. Na koi bus mein mere, na meri zaat meri. Na koi bus mein mere, na meri zaat meri. Ye kaisa sach hai ki sari kainat meri. Mera vajud to kal bhi na tha, na kal hoga. Mera vajud to kal bhi na tha, na kal hoga. Bas ek lamhe mein maujud hai zaat meri. गुजर गया यही लम्हा तो कल मैं नहीं होऊंगा इस लम्हे में पोशीदा है निजात मेरी थैंक यू
thank you, uh, Professor Waris Kedwai, sir, for your detailed description about the uh, risk factor of the hypertension and its preventive measure. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Rifat Sultana. Uh, Rifat Sultana is the executive director of Karachi Institute of Heart Disease. And uh, her uh, topic of presentation are uh, prevention of premature coronary artery disease. Please. Try. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Mansoor Ahmed, Professor Samad, and Professor Abdul Rashid. And especially, uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Mansoor Ahmed and his uh, team, Professor Abdul Rashid and Professor Abdul Samad, such a nice uh, conference and inviting me uh, in this academic activity. My presentation, I request Professor Abdul Rashid to my presentation because I am busy uh, in a second half. Otherwise, my presentation under the umbrella of the acute coronary syndrome as well as uh, go red for women. My commitment was with uh, Professor uh, Khalda Somro that I will do my presentation under the umbrella of go, go red. But uh, due to some reasons, I have requested that Professor Abdul Rashid to do my presentation in morning. Mein kar Thank you so much. So today my presentation, you know, uh, as uh, Professor Feroz Mamun said, topic prevention of coronary Each year, more women die from the cardiovascular disease than from the other cancers combined. Younger women are twice as likely to die of the heart attacks than the younger men. But the myth versus fact. Myth, men are more likely to have the heart disease. Well, what is the fact behind it? Heart disease, sorry. Heart disease is the number one killer of the man and the woman, while 15,000 and more women than the men die of the heart disease per year. Cancer is a bigger, uh, myth is cancer is a bigger, bigger threat than the heart disease. While what is the fact? Nearly twice as many as women die from the heart disease and the stroke than from all other cancer combined. What is the myth is doctors are aware of the woman risk for the heart disease and act accordingly. Well, what is the fact? Under treatment and the under diagnosis of the heart disease in a woman contribute to excess mortality in a uh, in women. Woman perception of heart disease. 72% of the young women aged 25 and 40 years of age still consider the cancer uh, to be the greatest threat to the woman's health. While some women know about the risk of heart disease, but do not hear it from their own doctors and do not personalize it, 65% of the women recognize that the symptoms may be atypical, but do not know the classic symptoms, or most women learn about the coronary, coronary artery disease from the magazines and from the web, but not from their own physicians. Women in a clinical trial, women are underrepresented in the cardiovascular trials. Evidence-based cardiovascular medicine biased towards the men. FDA and the National Institute of Health mandate only 50% enrollment of the women. While women need to be empowered to enroll in the clinical trials for the heart disease. Like similarly, uh, the breast cancer is a uh, good example. One, one in three women then the man dies of the hardest heart attack and the stroke. What are the uh, symptoms uh, of sinus symptoms of the heart attacks in the female patients? Gender differences in the emergency department presentation for CAD without the chest pain. You may appreciate these are the symptoms that are more commonly patient, female patients presented with dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, indigestion, fatigue, sweating, and the arm and the shoulder pain as compared to the male. Less common heart attack symptoms are milder symptoms without the accompanying chest pain. Sudden onset of weakness, shortness of breath, fatigue, body ache, overall feeling of illness, burning sensation in the chest may be the mistaken as heart burns. An unusual feeling of mild discomfort in the back, chest, arm, neck, or jaw. 
So the women are different than the men. Women are more commonly likely to be the older, unfortunately. Women are the more likely to have the high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and heart failure. Women are less likely to be a smoker. Women are experience heart attack differently than the men with the subtler symptoms like extreme, fati extreme fatigue, jaw pinch, SOP, backache, and nausea and indigestion. What are the risks behind it, risk factors? Major risk factors for the heart disease, as discussed earlier, almost similar as uh, in, the male, in the male patients, like these are the modifiable risk factors, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol level, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity. Non-modifiable are the family history, age, and gender, while the emerging risk factors are homocysteine level, lipoprotein A level, clotting factor, marker of CRP levels. And these are the emer emerging risk factors are lipoprotein level, homocysteine, prothrombotic factors, pro-inflammatory factors, impaired fasting glucose, subclinical atherosclerosis, other clinical forms of atherosclerotic disease, peripheral arterial disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm, symptomatic carotid artery disease, abnormal internal and carotid CIT, ankle arm index, and coronary calcium scoring. CAD risk factors, goals, what are the goals like hypertension, uh, minimal goal is one, less than 140, 90, and optimal goal is less than 120, 80. Similarly with the high cholesterol level, LDL, and th these, are the, these are the parameters to achieve the goal to prevent the heart disease. Similarly with the diabetes, diabetic patient nearly normal fasting level should be, uh, HbA1c should be, should be less than seven, and the optimal goal is same, and uh, cessation of the smoking. Major risk factors uh, is, are the diabetes, cigarette smoking, hypertension, low HDL level is very important, family history of premature coronary artery disease, and the age, man is greater than 45 years of age, while the females greater than 55, and high LDL cholesterol greater than 160 milligram per deciliter. Hypertension, 65% all the hypertensive remains either undetected or inadequately treated. People who are normal tensive at 55 have 90% lifetime risk of developing hypertension. Prevalence increased with the age and women live longer. Hypertension is more common in a females. Hypertension is more common with oral a female patient with the oral contraceptive pills and the obesity. Life have, uh, time approach to maintain the decrease, uh, reduce the blood pressure, and the dietary control is very important. Sodium restriction and increase physical activity. A smoking cessation is very important. In the, you know, is uh, in the, uh, at Pakistan, the although the cigarette smoking uh, among the females are not as common as in a Western world, while. Uh, our data publish uh, a gender-specific assessment of the tobacco use risk factor evidence from the latest Pakistan, Pakistan demographic and the healthy survey which was published in 6 June 2022 shows that the Pakistani individual among the world largest consumer of the tobacco and Pakistan rank among the top 15 countries in the world in terms of the disease burden associated with the tobacco smoking. According to the recent estimate among the adult age 50 in years and above 27 percent of the male and 5.5 females are uh, recorded as a daily tobacco users. The prevalence, 50% uh, of the heart attacks among the females are due to smoking. And women, uh, women who smoke and take oral contraceptive pills, they have got 30 times more chances to develop the coronary artery disease. Physical inactivity, as discussed in the male patient also, is very, very important for the female. Lack of exercise proven risk factor for the heart attacks. And lack of physical exercise is a growing epidemic all over the world. We see, we seem to eat much, hum khate bhoz zada hai, but more than that, we burn. Yani hum burn out kam kate hai, as compared to eating habits. Physical inactivity increase the uh, heart attack and a stroke. 30 minutes or more of the activity on most of all the days of the week can help reduce the risk of blood cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and uh, high blood pressure. Weight maintenance goal is BMI should be between the 18.5 and 24.9. Waist circumflex less than 35 inches for the woman and less than 40 inches for the man. And weight goal loss 10% of the body weight over six months or one to two pounds weight loss per week. Reduce calories by 500 to 1,000 calories per day. 
Clinical identification of the metabolic syndrome is important like abdominal obesity, these are the parameters, triglycerides, HDL level, blood pressure and the fasting glucose. Menopausal females, the risk of coronary artery disease is increased as you may appreciate before and after the menopause. As the menopause comes, the risk of coronary artery disease increases. Why is diabetes bad? At least 65% of people with the diabetes die from the coronary artery disease. Diabetes lower diabetes, good cholesterol, uh, diabetes lower good cholesterol while raise the bad cholesterol. Prevalence of diabetes in Pakistan, as we appreciate here, okay, from the 2006 and onwards, it goes on increase and increase and increases. Diabetes women at the high risk of heart attack. A report of Diabetic Association of Pakistan said the risk factor for developing heart disease are more common power and powerful in a woman with the diabetes. And added women before menopause are usually protected against due to the estrogen hormone and that diabetes override or while diabetes override or negate the protective effect of estrogen regardless of the age. Extreme fatigue that is different from the unusual digestion, nausea, vomiting may be the only symptom for the, uh, which the women can experience. The symptoms may be so vague that may often go be unnoticed. Unfortunately, unfortunately, too many women delay getting to the hospital either because of the denial or just no, no, no knowing the symptoms. Women with the diabetes who have a heart attack as twice as likely to have the second heart attack and the four times more likely to have the heart failure as compared to the male patients. Diabetes is a major risk factor for the heart attack as we, uh, we already discussed in detail. Women with the coronary artery disease risk factors, higher prevalence uh, of unavoidable uh, uh, risk factors increase cholesterol, physical inactivity, overweight, diabetes, more powerful risk factor for CAD, three to seven fold in a woman versus two to three fold in a man. While the low density, while high density, low level of the high density cholesterol level may be predictor of coronary artery disease. So, how to save the heart? Conclusion: Risk factor management is are very very important. That multiple risk factor require more aggressive management. Aggressive risk factor modification, often with the multiple medications, is the most effective strategy for reducing the consequence of the heart disease, according to the American Heart uh, American AH guidelines. And how to lower the heart disease risk? Begin today. I say start late, be physically active, 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity and follow a healthy eating habits like low in a saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol and a moderate in a total fat and limit the salt. Eating healthy, choose more fruit, vegetables like uh, grain bread and cereals and choose baked, skinless chicken, fish, low fat dairy products. Eat less saturated or trans fat, like eat more fibers like oat, fruits, vegetables, beans. And improving fats like uh, eat fewer solid fat, sub uh, substitute liquid or soft fat, he hard healthy fats, and mono, uh, mono unsaturated oil like olive oil and canola oil. Improving fat, avoid trans fat, and uh, this is trans fatty acid raises the LDL and lower the HDL and increase risk of heart attack are most commonly found in the fried food, uh, cookies, cakes, crackers, which love a lot, but we avoid this. Limit dry cholesterol can raise the blood cholesterol, limit food high in a cholesterol like liver, organ meat, egg yolk, full fat dairy products. And American Heart Association recommend less than 300 mg per day and less than 200 mg per day with the diabetes or the heart patients. Triglyceride, limit the triglycerides level or limit the alcohol uh, or exercise and weight loss and physical activity as we discussed, 30 minutes regular walk, weight maintenance, weight loss can decrease the LDL, triglyceride and increase the HDL and 5 to 10 pounds will help show the improvement. So heart disease lesson from the past decade, the importance of studying gender specific aspect of coronary artery disease helped in the following clinical dilemmas like presentation of CAD, women are older than the men, less specific clinical manifestation of CAD in a woman, greater difficulty in diagnosis, women greater than, greater difficult than the men, more severe consequence of MI when it occurs in a woman. 
So take home message, women shouldn't, shouldn't ignore or minimize chest pain or other heart attack symptoms. Thank you so much. Happy Independence Day, Pakistan Zindabad. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rifat Sultana. Uh, no, I will be invited to Dr. Kalimullah Sheikh, Associate Professor at the National Hospital, Paris Park. And his topic is, I think, peripheral artery disease in association with coronary artery disease. Sheikh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Kaleem, uh, working as an interventional cardiologist and program director at Akar National Hospital. Uh, sa hat ke baat karte. Uh, prevention of coronary artery disease. Fourth year mein hote the, to padte the ke atherosclerosis the diffuse processes. It is not specific to one site na. Uh, agar kahi pe bhi atherosclerotic ki koi evidence milti hai, that also correlated to the coronary artery disease. और हम हमें पता है कि जैसे-जैसे वक्त गुजरता जा रहा है कोरोनरी आर्टरी डिजीज प्रीवेलेंस में बढ़ती जा रही है स्पेशली इन दिस रीजन ऑफ द तो मोर फोकस शुड हैव टू बी डन ऑन प्रिवेंशन और वर्दी स्पीकर्स ने बताया कि हमारा ज्यादा फोकस सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन के ऊपर होता है दिस इज अ प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ पेरिफेरल वेस्कुलर डिजीज ए सिम्टोमेटिक 50% of the people who presented are actually asymptomatic without having any symptoms of peripheral vascular disease. Atypical symptoms, nearly 33% people are presented with atypical symptoms, not correlated. Typical symptoms are that you are in the same place, in a specific place every time. When you rest, your pain has been, which is intermittent claudication. That occurs only in 13 to 15 percent of the peoples, and one to three percent of the people presented as a threatening situation, where uh, in an emergency situation where you have to do an intervention. So, 50 percent के करीब इस मरीज होते हैं जो asymptomatically present करते हैं. और अगर आप by any means if you diagnose peripheral vascular disease, that is equivalent to coronary artery disease also. This is not an uncommon scenario that we look uh, in our daily practices. They say that the diabetes is prevalent in 2016, and we are number one in terms of population based. A 72 years male to outpatient department without any complaints, with the risk factors, he has a history of smoking, 40 years, hypertension, and borderline diabetes. He is only on mid, uh, amlodipine. His blood pressure is 140-86 with uh, non-palpable distal pulses, but otherwise no vascular findings. LDL-138. How many of you worried about this non-palpable pulses? Heart to open. Kare. Kaun sa year hai aap logon ka? Piche, are they students or doctors? Hai? Students kaun kaun se hai? अच्छा ओके okay. अच्छा मुझे बताएं कितने परेशान हैं इसकी पेरिफेरल लेस की जैसे हम अभी बात कर रहे थे कि हम जो है ना इंटरवेंशनल कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट मोर इंटरेस्टेड होते हैं कि जैसे ही मरीज आ जाए इसमें हमारा मोर इंटरेस्ट होता है और ओपीडी में लियाकर नेशनल हॉस्पिटल टर्शरी हॉस्पिटल है तो इस तरह के मरीज हम बहुत कॉमनली देखते हैं ये बताएं कितने लोग हैं जो परेशान हैं कैसी परेशानी डजेंट गिव एनी सिंटर कितने लोग हैं हाथ ऊपर करें जो परेशान हैं के अच्छा सिर्फ दो तीन लोग ही परेशान हैं अच्छा लेट्स सी के आ, इसकी नॉन पल्पेबल पल्सेस से जो कि इस डायग्नोसिस ऑफ पेरिफेरल वेस्कुलर डिजीज डिफरेंशियल डायग्नोसिस भी हो सकती है दैट इज अ स्मोकर हो सकता है कोई वेस्कुलाइटिस हो but uh, agar peripheral vascular disease diagnose ho jati hai to what is the impact of this on cardiovascular outcomes why do we care about his diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease this is in two studies rotendam and san diego as you can see with the passage of time as you ages your prevalence of having 
peripheral vascular diseases increases. So our patients lies here, as you, as you see. Independent risk factor for peripheral arterial disease. Uh, not only isolated risk factors have an impact, diabetes has the most, our perivalence is increasing. Smoking, hypertension, total cholesterol. 2014, mein, we have a first time uh, primary prevention uh, ATP4 uh, report jo aayi thi. Usme unhone kaha tha ke bhai primary prevention and you have to calculate the overall risk of the patient. Or jiska saadhe saath percent se jyada risk hai hypertensive population, they should have to be started on statins also. To accumulated risk hai. To agar kisi ko diabetes hai, to usko risk hai double ho jata hai risk. Lekin agar wo hypertensive bhi hai, they also multiply the risk. Na. Isi tarah se dyslipidemic hai, smoker hai. So everything, if you have, it multiplies your risk of having chances of peripheral vascular disease. So, the multiple risk factors have got a synergistic effect. You see, 8 per year rate per thousand. That means, if we follow 1,000 people for one year, then there is a chance of average of 8 people. If your systolic blood pressure is 105, and serum cholesterol is 200, and you do not have a diabetes, so, it's only 2.6%. But if you are a, a systolic blood pressure 195 with a serum cholesterol 335 with a uncontrolled sugar or diabetes, risk increases to 36. So, 36 may peripheral vascular disease diagnosed ho jayegi if you have a multi. Of three having a peripheral and you know, 50 percent of the people presented asymptomatically without having any symptoms. Uh, typical, as I uh, said, 33 percent having a atypical symptoms. What is atypical symptoms? They do not having an exertional leg pains, but they may involve areas other than the calls may not stop the patient from walking or may not resolve within 10 minutes of the rest. Typical symptoms, they have already been defined. Have a, when they walk, they have a particular pain at one side and they are relieved within 10 minutes period of time. The intermittent claudic, the, the typical symptoms, it is called intermittent claudications. This is a study that shows that those who are more than 55 years safe, 5% people have intermittent claudications. And what is the outcome? Peripheral vascular outcome? I was just to take your presentation. 16% of the people have got a worsening intermittent claudications. Bypass surgery has got 7% and major amputations in 4% of the people. Other cardiovascular morbidities, 5-year mortality is 30%. And cardiovascular mortality is 75 percentage who has got a peripheral vascular disease diagnosis. Uh, it's not working. Excuse me. Okay. What is an impact of peripheral vascular disease? This is another survival chart. If you look followed for 12 years of period, those who has got a without any peripheral vascular disease, Asymptomatic large vessel peripheral arterial disease, symptomatic and severe symptoms. As you can see, 75 percent less survival chance who has got a severe symptomatic uh, peripheral vascular disease as compared to, to the normal subjects over the period of 12 years of follow-ups. As I said, ke atherosclerotic is a diffuse process. It increases the chances of having heart attack, stroke six times as compared to, to the normal subjects. The complications in periprocedural complications, whatever procedures they have undergone, either coronary artery bypass grafting 
are uh, uh, having uh, angioplasties. As you can see, without having history of peripheral vascular disease, the outcome is not good as compared to. It doubles the risk of complications. Normally, we see that there is 5% chances of uh, having uh, death in patient presented with uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction treated with primary PCI. But those who have got a peripheral vascular disease, they, their risk becomes doubles. They have a 10 percent chances of uh, having death of that one. The, those who have got uh, undergone uh, coronary revascularization, it is 4.5 times relative risk increases those who have got a peripheral vascular disease diagnosis. And in STEMI undergone primary PCI, you can see the difference in the graph. It is nearly doubles the mortality those in those patients who has got a uh, diagnosed peripheral vascular disease. So how do we establish a diagnosis of peripheral artery disease or assess the severity and localized disease? As my patient is asymptomatic, so I have to make a diagnosis. What are the algorithms? This is 2016 um, ACC guidelines of peripheral vascular diseases. As you can see, history and physical examination of peripheral artery disease without response, non-healing wound or gangrene. This is my patient who is presented. AB, do we start with the ankle brachial index? Okay, tell me, ankle brachial index, who knows who knows? Do you want to give your hands? Students? Where did you go? Just one of your hands. Okay, we check the difference between legs and arms. तो अगर नॉर्मली लेग्स के प्रेशर ज़्यादा होते हैं अगर वो कम हो जाए आम से तो देट इज वन ऑफ फर्स्ट स्टेप फॉर डायग्नोसिंग पेरिफरल वेस्कुलर डिजीज यहाँ पर देखें तो नॉर्मल ए बी आई जो होता है वन टू वन पॉइंट फोर अगर वन पॉइंट फाइव से ज़्यादा है तो फिर आप नेक्स्ट स्टेप करते हैं टो ब्रेकियल इंडेक्स टो का प्रेशर चेक करते हैं और अगर वो पॉइंट सेवन से कम है तो देट इज़ अ डायग्नोसिस ऑफ पेरीफरल वेस्कुलर डिजीज लेकिन अगर आपका नॉर्मल आता है Asymptomatic मरीज तो next step you can do an exercise ABI. Here asymptomatic patients में you do not require to do any non-invasive or invasive test ना for the diagnosis. Third जो जिनका point nine से कम है they have already been diagnosed with that one. Provided के differential diagnosis you have to rule out. जैसे मैंने कहा कि एक जैसे peripheral vascular disease की one of प्रेजेंटेशन है आपको लोकलाइज भी करना होता है लेकिन ये स्मोकर पेशेंट्स हैं तो उनमें वेस्कुलाइटिस भी हो सकता है बेजस डिजीज जैसे कहते हैं तो आप डिफरेंशियल डायग्नोसिस को भी जहन में रखेंगे अच्छा जो सिम्टोमेटिक पेशेंट्स होते हैं जो जिनको पेरिफर आर्टरी डिजीज वो रेस्ट पे नॉन इंडिंग वूंड्स और गेंग्रीन तो उनमें भी तो स्टार्ट विथ यू हैव टू स्टार्ट विथ ए बी आई वन पॉइंट फोर से ज़्यादा है तो टी बी आई करेंगे अगर ये नॉन इंडिंग वूड है या गेंग्रीन है तो फिर आप परफ्यून असेसमेंट करेंगे टी बी आई विथ वेव फॉर्म के साथ ट्रांसक्यूटनस ऑक्सीजन सेचुरेशन चेक करेंगे आई स्किन परफ्यून प्रेशर चेक करेंगे और अगर एब नॉर्मल है तो अगेन दैट विल बी देन यू स्विच टू हैविंग अ डुप्लेक्स अल्ट्रासाउंड सी टी स्कैन या एम आर आई एम आर ए करके आप कन्फर्म करेंगे लोकलाइज करेंगे कि कहाँ पर उनको हैं वाट शुड वी बी थिंकिंग अबाउट इन हिज ट्रीटमेंट इसको कोई ट्रीटमेंट देनी चाहिए कि नहीं कोई ट्रीटमेंट देनी चाहिए इसको अब पल्सेस नहीं आ रही हैं डायग्नोसिस हो गया है कि पेरिफरल वेस्कुलर डिजीज है तो मेजर जो ट्रीटमेंट है ना प्रिवेंशन के ऊपर है क्योंकि ये एसिम्टोमेटिक मरीज हैं स्मोकर हैं कोलेस्ट्रॉल बढ़ा हुआ है ब्लड प्रेशर टारगेट नहीं है तो मेन फोकस शुड हैव टू बी ऑन देट वन के रिस्क फैक्टर मॉडिफिकेशन होनी चाहिए He should have a complete cessation. He should target LDL should have to be less than 70, blood pressure 130, 80, or A1C less than 7 percentage. Antiplatelet therapy, aspirin or clopidogrel, he is a candidate for that one. But many professional societies include aspirin among first line agents in the guidelines. अगर सिम्टम्स हो रहे हैं तो intermittent clarification के साथ तो exercise therapy है, drugs पहले पेंटॉक्सी फाइलिन भी देते थे चेलेशन थेरापी भी करते थे नाउ दे आर क्लास थ्री रिकमेंडेशन द ओनली ड्रग दैट इज रिकमेंडेड एज अ क्लास वन ड्रग इज अलेस्टेजॉल रिवेस्कुलाइजेशन करेंगे सीवियर डिसेबिलिटी के लिए 
And influenza vaccine, someone who is diagnosed as a peripheral vascular disease, it's a class one recommendation. Um, jo percutaneous treatment hai, goal to provide relief of symptoms. Agar critical limb ischemia hai, to wound care, antibiotic, revascularization, whatever forms you will adopt, goal to promote limb survival. Achha, endovascular procedure should not have to be performed in patients with peripheral artery disease solely to prevent progression of chronic limb ischemia. Sirf chronic limb ischemia ki progression ko rokne ke liye koi interventions is not required. It's a risk factor modification and lifestyle modification. Achha, is I initially I said you have to localize ke kaha par aapko jo hai na uh, obstruction hai. If obstruction is a aortoiliac arteries, jo abdominal part hai, wahan par agar hai, to phir do options hamare paas available hai, percutaneous intervention, aortofemoral bypass, primary patency 5 years ki 81 to 85 percent hai with a bypass and with percutaneous in intervention ki 65 to 80 percent hai. Very high perioperative mortality with the surgeries, 5 to 8 percent and perioperative mortality 0.1 percent ke kareeb hai. Reserved for severe diffuse disease, uh, sorry, um, localized disease mein treatment of choice hai. Rutherford is a classification system that we used, is mein grading bhi hoti hai aur class bhi hota hai on the basis of symptoms and uh, uh, progression of the disease. So, if two ke kareeb hai, jo ke intermittent cladification hai, aur three hai wound hai, to phir is mein jo hai, is a treatment of choice to be recommended. Uh, these are the lien guided treatment options. Endovascular is a procedure of choice. You can see localized disease hai. Here you can also fix it percutaneously. Lekin agar extensive disease hai, complex hai, to bypass surgery is a preferred of options. Agar femoropopliteal region mein uh, obstructions hai, to again we have a two options, femoropopliteal bypass surgery or femoropopliteal angiography, angioplasties. Primary patency 5 years 60 to 80 percent hai, iski 40 to 70 percent ke kareeb hai. Autologous vein preferred hai to synthetic graft, PTFA graft lagate hai, ya phir venous grafting karte hai, ye nitinol stents hote hai, jo place karte hai. This may be perioperative mortality 0 to 3 percent, here 0.1 percent ke kareeb hai, indicated for same Rutherford class na. These are the, some of the uh, diagrammatic presentations where you can have a preferred surgery versus endovascular treatments. Uh, this is a March 2003 it, where it is a retrospective data which compares the, last size, which compares the three modes of management two surgeries, PTFA covered, ya venous bypass graft, ya nitinol stains percutaneously. Venous graft actually shows a better patency over five years rate as compared to PTA, uh, um, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene bypass, so ya per nitinol stain. Mein. As you can see here, the clinical improvement was also significantly superior with venous bypass after four years of follow-up and patency rate is also better with venous. So this is a uh, treatment of choice when you do a surgery, venous grafting is preferred. If you have a critical limb ischemia, one, which is only 1 to 3 percent of the people's presented, one year outcome, 45 percent lives with uh, two limbs, uh, continued chronic limb ischemia, 20 percentage out of 45 and resolved in 25 percentage. 30 percent has undergone amputations and 25 percent, one out of four die because of uh, this critical limb ischemia. This is another algorithm which is shown if you have acutely cold, painful legs and you are suspecting acute limb ischemia, you do a clinical evaluation including symptoms, motor and sensory assessment in arterial venous Doppler. So you have a history and examinations along with the Doppler findings. If you have a Audible arterial, audible venous, you can, it is a salvageable vessels and you do a revascularization. If you have inaudible arterial but audible venous system, which you do with a duplex ultrasound, then you secondly assess the motor systems. Either motor system intact or impaired in both of the situations, it is advisable to salvage the limbs. But if you have a irreversibly damaged, 
uh, amputation is a treatment of choice now. So this is my last slide. Uh, peripheral artery disease is common and has a significant impact upon cardiovascular outcomes. Treatment of PAD, even asymptomatic, should focus on risk factor modification, risk reduction. Treatment of intermittent claudication should include exercise therapy, drug therapy, and selective use of revascularization. For critical limb ischemia, warrants aggressive efforts of revascularization, including surgery to reduce the amputation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Kalimola Sheikh. Uh, before inviting the next uh, uh, speaker, I would uh, like to invite Professor Javed Akbar Siyal to come on the desk as a chairperson. The next speaker is uh, uh, Professor uh, Wakar Kazmi Saab. He is the ex-principal of Karachi Medical and Dental College and the eminent nephrologist. His topic is the chronic kidney disease uh, and its prevention in, with the coronary artery disease. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, uh, I'll try to be keep myself within the time limits. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of NCPC, uh, Professor Mansoor and Professor Rashid, for giving me this opportunity to be here. So, uh, without taking much time, I'll move on because I know I have to cover up a lot of things and. Uh, so this is going to be a nephrologist perspective of, you know, uh, and I'm going to highlight a very important uh, subject in nephrology, which, is, which has a very strong association with heart disease. So this is something that we are going to talk about. Uh, this is for the youngsters, what, how, how we define CKD, so I, I won't, you know, uh, go, uh, just hurriedly go through it. These are the various classifications of CKD. Now, why is CKD so important? Chronic kidney disease, I'm, no, I'm sure you all know. First of all, it's a public health problem. Why? Because the prevalence is extremely high. The resource utilization is, is enormously high. Lots and lots of money are being spent on dialysis patients and all these things. And the other very important thing why CKD is taken so seriously because CKD patients have a very strong association with cardiovascular complication. Now these are the patients who are going to die of cardiovascular complication. They are not going there. They probably will not even reach the stage five of CKD, and they will probably die much earlier due to cardiovascular complication. And I'm going to talk about a very important subject, a very interesting, might be something new for, which this is something uh, that, you know, came up uh, in, during the late 90s, uh, during, uh, after the publication of Adira Levin's paper, where she highlighted the fact that uh, CKD patients have, are coming up with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy very early during the process of CKD. I'm going to talk about this paper in detail, but that, that is where, you know, uh, this interest of anemia and CKD uh, grew up. And she highlighted the fact that anemia is the major culprit. Anemia was the major culprit, and we know anemia is very common among CKD patients. And she highlighted the fact that anemia is the major culprit in causing left ventricle hypertrophy. We're going to talk about that. And keep in mind, you know, uh, uh, as far as CKD pa uh, patients are concerned, even mild CKD is a risk factor for, uh, for mortality. So don't take these patients lightly. I'll be the 1.8 creatine. Take this patient seriously. He or she might die of cardiovascular complication. Okay. Uh, so I, as I said, the prevalence is high. This is my paper, which I presented, and I, we showed here that you know about 21 million people in, in Pakistan are suffering from CKD. Big, the number is big, obviously, because there are so many speakers have highlighted the fact that we have so much diabetes, we have so much hypertension, and obviously the, the, the prevalence of CKD is enormously high compared to the West. The uh, uh, amount of money being spent, um, uh, the Medicare is spending, and this is the figure of 1999, the latest figure is they are spending something crazy like 35 billion dollars a year. They are bankrupt. Medicare is bankrupt because of dialysis patients. 
So a lot of uh, expenditure is being done on these patients. And, and, and just look at this slide. And you can see here the people with serum creatinine uh, less than 1 compared to 1.1 to 1.5. And then finally 1.5 to 2.5. Now 1.5 to 2.5, very mild CKD. But look at the survival. This survival is much poor, much poor compared to people with serum creatinine less than 1.0. So even early CKD is a risk factor for mortality. Now, now this point was uh, uh, anemia. I, uh, again, a very interesting point for you people, and I'll, I'll show it with my data also, that anemia comes up relatively early during CKD. We were uh, under the impression, oh, TK, jab stage 5 will come, then anemia will come, then we will see erythropoietin, denge, nahi denge, whatever. But, you know, I'll show you from uh, data that anemia comes up relatively early during CKD. And, you know, I highlighted it for, for the, uh, let me try to make people understand. What we did was we categorized, categorized our patients according to their uh, ser uh, kidney function. This is less than 2 creatinine, this is 2 to 3 creatinine, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and greater than 5. So obviously these are the patients with worse kidney function. These are pa patients with mild renal impairment. And, and we looked at the uh, hematocrit or hemoglobin groups. This is less than 10, this is less than 11. So these two are anemic groups as far as National Kidney Foundation is concerned. These two groups are anemic. And look at people with less than 2 creatinine, 25% of them are anemic. Now this was a very strong uh, finding, you know, in my paper. And, and the uh, reviewers gave advice, and we published this, uh, this uh, paper with that title. So this, and of course, as the creatinine function, as the kidney function is getting worse and worse, you can see more people with bad hemoglobins. So obviously, as the kidney function deteriorates, the, uh, people with uh, bad hemoglobins are going to get higher and higher and higher. Uh, we know that these are some of the causes uh, uh, that contribute to anemia, insufficient erythropoietin, and iron deficiency, and all these stuff. Uh, we can see these are the uh, uh, contributory factors to anemia in CKD patients. And what, what are the consequences of anemia? Left ventricle hypertrophy, on top of the list, precipitating factor for cardio uh, uh, congestive heart failure, it exacerbates an uh, ang uh, episode of angina and all these things. So these are, this is what anemia can, can cause in CKD patients. Uh, we thought, you know, in our group in Boston, we thought that, you know, anemia is the culprit. This is the culprit between, you know, CKD and cardiovascular uh, morbidity. So anemia is the, is the factor leading to this. Now, th now this is very interesting. Please, for the for the cardiologist, this is this is where you know this debate and this this so much excitement about anemia cause anemia and CKD came up. This was Adina Levin's paper, and she's a famous Canadian nephrologist, and she highlighted the fact that look at this: people with greater than 50 GFR, 27 percent of them have already developed left ventricle hypertrophy. And look at by the time they go into uh, and have GFR less than 25, 45% of them have developed left ventricle hypertrophy. So this was a, a very, uh, you know, strong message from her paper. And this is how, you know, people started looking at anemia very seriously. And she highlighted the fact in her, she did a multivariate regression analysis. And she highlighted the fact that anemia was independently associated with the develop development of left ventricle hypertrophy. I'll show you this idea here. So for every 5.5 gram per deciliter decrease in hemoglobin, the risk of left ventricle hypertrophy goes up by 32%. And this risk is much greater than, you know, systolic blood pressure, an increase of 5 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure and a left, rest, uh, left ventricle mass index decrease of, you know, 10 gram per square meter. So uh, this is very important, and she highlighted the fact that in anemia is an independent risk factor for the development of left ventricle hypertrophy. Again, a very interesting paper, paper coming from Japan, and these people, Hayashi et al., they found out that, you know, 
decrease in left ventricular mass index in patient whose hematocrit was corrected with erythropoietin. Within 12 months, the left ventricular mass index could decrease to normal levels. Again, a very important finding. Correct their hemoglobins by erythropoietin and the left ventricular mass uh, regression occurs. Same, a, a similar paper by Portol, Portol et al. And they also had similar findings. So, so these results provide evidence that earlier and aggressive treatment of anemia and CKD, this is for my cardiology colleagues, please take anemia seriously. We have the same patient. The same patients are coming to you. The same patients are coming to me. They are coming to you for cardiovascular. Please keep a, at least look into the hemoglobin levels and try to do something regarding that as well. Again, a very interesting paper, and this has shown that pe people with less, uh, lesser left ventricular mass index performed much better. Their survival was much better compared to people with greater left, vascular, left ventricular mass index. This is another very important slide. We take uh, these things very, uh, you know, a non-serious attitude, but look at this uh, paper coming from Foley. And he has pointed out something very interesting that by the time, at the time of initiation of dialysis, only 15%, look at this, uh, uh, you know, piece of the pie. Only these percent of, 15% of patients are normal. The rest, all of the patients have developed some form of cardiovascular comorbidity. So as far as I am concerned, you know, by the time we go on to initiate dialysis, the battle is already lost. We've already lost the battle. People, 85% of the people have already developed left ventricular hypertrophy. So what is the message? Treat these patients earlier. Try to prevent left ventricular hypertrophy. Prevent them from going into, uh, you know, cardiovascular complications. But by the time they go on to dialysis, they've already have done a lot of damage to themselves. Again, this is, uh, again, a very interesting paper. And you see the ESRD population, 10 folds greater increase in uh, cardiac mortality. Now, as far as the National Kidney Foundation uh, guidelines are concerned, they have highlighted the fact that these CKD patients should a hemoglobin, have a hemoglobin between 11 and 12 gram percent. And this is the definition of iron deficiency as uh, iron deficiency anemia. And they have asked to treat anemia in CKD with erythropoietin and IV iron. No oral iron, please. So with that background and with Adira Lever 11's paper coming up in the in late 90s, a lot of interest grew into uh, about the you know, incidence of uh, anemia in CKD patients. So uh, people, nephrologists, started looking about into their own nephrology practices. Are we doing a good job as far as anemia management is concerned? And this is for the first time, alhamdulillah, you know, my group in Boston, and this is called the famous Boston Chart Audit, and we, we formed a, a registry of CKD patients, and we looked as, as to how we were doing as far as anemia management was concerned. And I'll tell you the conclusion of uh, this paper was that nephrologists were not doing a good job as far as the management of anemia is concerned. But the, I should give you the good news also, this is late 90s and early 2000s. But now things have changed drastically in, in the Western world. And my idea of presenting this paper here is that we still have to pull up our socks. They are, they are doing, the developed world is doing well, but we are not up to the mark as far as anemia management is concerned. So with that, we looked at and did this paper. And I'll just give you the very, uh, some of the very salient results. Uh, I don't want to go into detail of this paper. And this is, we looked at the uh, CKD patient. We have this registry. We took patients from three multi, uh, from, uh, uh, from three uh, tertiary care hospitals and, and two, uh, three nursing, uh, and, uh, three private practices. And so this is what, just to give you some summary. The nephro this is the first, at the initiation of, uh, at the first time they come to the nephrology, warning to the nephrologist, come up, do a better job. And see, again, so many pe people who had severe anemia, only this much were receiving erythropoietin. And then, then what we 
uh, thought was, okay, look at the macro perspective. What is going on during, uh, all over the USA? So we looked at the USRDS data, United States Regional Data System, and to our surprise, you know, they, they were not doing too well as also. Sorry. So only 77% were not receiving erythropoietin uh, in the USRDS data. So this is this was our our uh, the conclusion result. We looked, we did a multivariate regression analysis, and we found out that having one nephrology visit or going very seldom to the nephrologist was associated with the higher risk of severe anemia, and uh, having a, a greater GFR, greater serum albumin level, and white race had lesser odds of developing anemia. Uh, so I would like to summarize here now. CKD is a public health problem. Please understand that. Why? Because the prevalence is extremely high. Patients have increased comorbidities and resource utilization is enormous. CVD, cardiovascular disease, begins early during CKD, ADIRA 11. Let's go back to ADIRA 11's paper and she has pointed out this fact that it comes up relatively early. At the initiation of renal replacement therapy, almost 85% of the patients have already developed some sort of cardiovascular complication. Anemia is an important predictor of uh, CVD, again, ADIRA 11. She has pointed out that it was an independent risk factor. And then, according to our paper, the Boston Chart Audit, we found out that anemia begins early during CKD. Treatment of anemia and CKD was crucial because the association of cardiovascular disease and correction of anemia in early CKD can reverse left ventricle hypertrophy and improve future outcomes, higher she et al. paper. And uh, anemia and CKD, again, uh, concluding point from our paper, was underdiagnosed and undertreated then in the late 90s, but things are definitely, things have improved in the developed world. However, we need to, we in Pakistan and, you know, the underdeveloped need to acquaint ourselves more with the National Kidney Foundation guidelines and, and, you know, do a better job. And, of course, better management of CKD will improve outcome among patients with CKD. I need to th acknowledge the contribution of my, uh, my colleagues, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wakar Kazimi. And we will take the next speaker on Zoom. Uh, he's from Islamabad, Dr. Akhtar Ali Bandisha. Uh, he's a professor of uh, cardiology at the uh, PIMS Medi uh, Pakistan Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, IT department, Dr. Akhtar is online with us? Yes. Welcome to Dr. Akhtar. Please start your talk. Assalamu alaikum. Can you listen to me, please? And yes. uh, can you see my slides now, please? Yes, clear. Yes. Thank you very much. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I'm very uh, thankful to the organizers who have given me an opportunity to talk in this, on this forum, and I congratulate uh, Professor Rashid Saab and his colleagues for organizing this. They had a lot of, uh, actually, hiccups uh, while organizing this. They had to postpone it for a while, but it's a very good opportunity, and they have attained it very good, and very good talks I was listening from last uh, one hour, actually. So my talk is about the very new risk factors for coronary artery disease. And why this is important? Because we know that uh, car ca the cardiovascular diseases, they are the major cause of uh, premature deaths worldwide. Around 30% of the uh, deaths, they occur because of the cardiovascular disease diseases. And uh, it is both in men and women. And this is in the whole world. And if you compare the cardiovascular disease deaths 
with the other causes of medical causes of death like malignancies, uh, respiratory diseases, injuries, HIV and all those, if you compare the bars, you can see that the bar with the cardiovascular mortality, it actually, oh, it, it's quite big one actually, and if you compare it with the rest of the causes. So it's a very, very important uh, cause of uh, morbidity and mortality, and we have to take care of this. And uh, this is a 2023 update, and it shows in America, every 34 seconds, one person is dying of cardiovascular disease, and every three minute and 17 seconds of one person is having stroke actually so it's a huge number and look at how we will be having our data in our part of the world because we are different and we have a much more cardiovascular disease burden than america and the west if you look at this slide the delis per 100,000 per years, the red lines, the red, red area that shows the uh, countries which have the maximum uh, problems with the cardiovascular disease and because of their delis actually the, the uh, uh, problem we are having and we are in this area. So there are certain risk factors which are associated with coronary artery disease, we all know, and two major, major trials in inter-heart and inter-stroke studies, they have showed that nine and 10 common risk factors accounted for more than 90% of the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke and established the focus in prevention of these common cardiovascular disease risk factors. So nine or 10 risk factors, they are contributing more than 90% of the risk of cardiovascular diseases. So if we can change them, if we can control them, if they can, we can modify them, we can significantly improve the cardiovascular disease burden. Various research studies over the past two decades, uh, two decades uh, indicate more than 80% of all cardiovascular events may be prevented by healthy lifestyle and management of known cardiovascular risk factors. And if we adopt healthy lifestyle to modify these risk factors like consume healthy diet, uh, avoid tobacco use, avoid reduce uh, uh, overweight or obesity and do physical activity regularly and we control diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension and in certain cases pre 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 use of aspirin and statins and primary prevention or secondary prevention, we can have a significant improvement in cardiovascular disease burden. But there is a health inequity in the world Around four in every five cardiovascular deaths, they are occurring in low and middle income countries. And we are part of that area actually. And progress in cardiovascular health is increasingly concerned high, uh, concentrated in high income countries, a glaring health inequity that must urgently be addressed. Look at the, uh, how, how much money the high income countries, they are spending on cardiovascular health and how much the low and middle income countries. So if you cannot spend money on cardiovascular health, you will probably will not be able to get the best results as have we have seen in European countries as well as in America. So 2,700 are more than that dollars and then 74 dollars we are spending or are in low income or middle income countries are spending. And how much of the countries in the world are spending 5% of their GDP on health. High income countries, 90%, 90, more than 97% of them are spending 5% of their GDP. Central Europe and European countries, Central Asia, they're spending around 85, uh, around 85% of the countries, they're spending 5% GDP, uh, their, their GDP. Uh, then if you look at the South Asia and Oceania, 50%, countries they are spending 5% GDP and we in South Asia we are not spending 5% none of the countries in this part of the world are spending 5% of the GDP. This this is a program which was initiated by American Heart Association to, in 2007 that working on these seven uh, modifiable risk factors they can reduce the cardiovascular disease burden in america around 20 percent in 10 years in next years it, it was a huge success actually and we know those those risk factors act so these factors classified under three categories ideal intermediate and poor uh, i'm not going into detail of these because of the time problem and this was so successful that in 2021 they added another eighth 
indicator in this there which was asleep actually that in addition to diabetes hypertension smoking uh, exercise weight and all those uh, we must have a good sleep of 6 to 8 hours to prevent cardiovascular disease burden or death sleep duration is associated with cardiovascular health measured by average hours of sleep or per night the ideal level is 7 to 9 hours daily for adults ideal sleep ranges for children are 10 to 16 years per 24 hours for age 5 and younger and 9 to 12 hours for age 6 to 12 years and 10 8 to 10 hours for ages 13 to 18 hours so sleep is an important risk factor nowadays le le deprivation of sleep we have been talking about the novel risk factors like homocysteinemia hyperuricemia elevated serum fibrinogen raised crp levels etc but we, i will be talking about the very new risk factors which have come in last few decades uh, uh, and years in, into the focus and they are contributing in the development of the cardiovascular disease and if we work on that we uh, uh, can improve the numbers. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it is, uh, uh, it links to cardiovascular disease. It is also the most common chronic liver disease in the developed world. And in 2017 data meta-analysis, 77% higher risk of cardiovascular disease and over double the risk for coronary artery disease in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. A more re recent prospective study revealed that patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease had greater than double the risk of cardiovascular events. Patients with liver fibrosis had a fourfold increase. Chronic kidney disease, as uh, the previous speaker, Professor, was saying, it has emerged as an important risk factor, independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. Pro-inflammatory med med mediators like ox oxidative stress, decreased nitric oxide production leading to endothelial dysfunction have been reported as possible mechanisms. Silent myocardial infarction occur more commonly, likely due to higher incidence of diabetic and uremic neuropathy in patients with CKD. CKD with a GFR 15 to 59 is noted as risk enhancing a factor in the American Heart Association guidelines for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. SLE, the most common cause of mortality in SLE is cardiovascular disease. There is also a higher prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in these patients. The uh, mechanism is likely a pro-inflammatory effect on coronary microcirculation. Pericarditis is also a very common manifestation of SLE, we all know. Rheumatoid arthritis, it, it has been seen that uh, our rheumatoid arthritis patients have a 1.5 to 2 fold increased risk of coronary artery disease. Traditional risk factors such as body mass and lipoprotein levels also showed more unpredictable accuracy. The mechanism behind this associated is risk is likely through a pro-inflammatory effect. Rheumatoid arthritis is also listed among the risk enhancing factors in American Heart Association, primary prevention cardiovascular guidelines. IBD in 2017 meta analysis noted that IBD, IBD inflammatory bowel disease is associated with high risk of coronary artery disease. However, the results were interpreted with caution due to heterogeneity of studies. The mechanism of the risk was uncertain, but again, it was thought to be due to chronic inflammatory state. So inflammation is playing an uh, important role in the development of the cardiovascular disease. HIV is understood to come with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and is associated sickly. A 2018 expert analysis from American Heart, uh, College of Cardiology noted that patients with HIV showed up 1.5 to 2-fold increased risk of coronary artery disease. The mechanism again was based on pro-inflammatory state. Thyroid gland intricately links to cardiovascular function. It's a master gland actually. It affects all the hormones. Proposed mechanism includes the effect of thyroid hormone on dyslipidemia, cardiac function, atherosclerosis, vascular com compliance, and cardiac arrhythmia. This is an area still under study. Guidelines also vary on their screening recommendations for thyroid disease, hypothyroidism, and subclinical hypothyroidism, but it is an area which should be looked into more detail, how uh, hypothyroidism or hyper there uh, acting on cardiovascular system and in specifically and in other systems generally. 
low levels of uh, testosterone probably have studied and debated over the past decade vitamin d deficiency has a link with an increased risk of coronary artery disease further studies however have not confirmed a beneficial effect on vitamin d supplementation further studies are needed to clarify whether vitamin d supplementation is truly beneficial for coronary artery disease prevention or not Socioeconomic status has come up as a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Earlier it was said that cardiovascular disease are disease of the rich, but now the underprivileged, they are coming more with the cardiovascular disease. Upstream determinants include financial strain, lack of affordable and nutrition to coronary artery disease. Proposed mechanisms for this include coronary microvascular dysfunction, ad altered endothelial tone, structural changes, and altered response to vasodilator stimuli. 